about that. I am little Freddie Kane, the Good Bucket Blues player, the last human being alive that plays the Good Bucket Blues. Now, what does that mean exactly? Good Bucket Blues mean is really what they call the lowest, lowest that you could get. Deep and low in the blues. It's just like sleeping in a hollow log at night and drinking muddy water and walking and going to work every day and don't make money and you wear holes in the bottom of your shoes and you don't have money and you're not able to buy any more. So that gives you the gut bucket blues. Now how did you learn it? How did I learn the blues? Yeah. To play the blues? Well actually I was born with the blues then and my daddy he also played music, played blues also. And I was a little bit of boy, five, six years old, and uh, he'd get off from work, he'd sit on the front porch and play his guitar and sing. And I was his, his, his first customer sitting on the porch right in front of him, watching him and listening at him play. And so I always wanted to play from a little boy, so he showed me three chords, how to make three chords. And so I was small and I couldn't use them right, but I never did forget them. So I just kept playing with the guitar. So my daddy would leave away from home, go to Mississippi Delta, and play music up there. And then he would pick cotton. He made a special trip to go up there to season up when when you start picking cotton. So he'd go up there and pick cotton. Sometimes muddy water would be off him too, and be at home. Sometimes muddy water would give him a hand, you know throw him a bone and let him come play with him sometimes in some of those uh, clubs up there. Did you get to see that? No, no, I was too small. too small. I didn't get to see that. Years, years after I see what the place was and everything. Way years after I had started touring, you know, and going up there playing like uh, the Kane Business Festival and Hell of the Arkansas. So, so that's how I got a chance to see up through that way. So I was born in Macomb, Mississippi, which was something like maybe about about uh, 300 miles south of, uh, of Clarksdale. What were some of the first songs that you learned to play? Well, the first song that I come to learn to play, that was what I was playing a while ago, Rabbit on the Log. So that's when my dad and my grandpa used to play that song. And my grandpa, he played the violin. But during that time, I didn't know the name of it, and I used to call it the Yee the he said, I said, come on, Papa, play the Yeedyatta for me. He said, what are you talking about, boy? I said, the Yeedyatta, what you do like this? And so my dad come from the Delta. He go to the Delta, and he leave the guitar in the corner. And I would get up and look at the guitar, and I pass by the guitar maybe five or six hundred times. And every, time, every trip I make by the guitar, then I'll get closer and closer. He was tempting me, you know, he was drawing me. So I got it close enough, and then I grabbed the guitar out the corner and started banging on it, trying to play it. And I broke the string on the guitar. So I grabbed the guitar and I run back in there and I went and tried to hide it underneath the bed. And I said, no, this ain't gonna work. I hide it under the bed because when he come in, he goes straight to the corner and get the guitar and go to the porch and set it in a rocking chair and started playing. So I goes back, take the guitar out underneath the bed, put it back in the corner where he puts it at. And so he came in that, 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 that night. So he come and went out to grab the guitar, went and sat in the rocking chair on the porch and right back and just strummed down on the guitar and said, boy, come here, right now. I said, uh oh, I got it coming, I know. He said, boy, why you break my guitar? I said, Dad, I didn't break your guitar. I said, boy, don't you lie to me. He said, because I know you're the only one going to touch my guitar. He said, go out there and get me one of those rat tan vines. Y'all know what a rat tan vine is? Well, you know, like these great big vines that go up in trees, like with Jungle Jim or Tarzan used to swing across the bayou with? He said, go out there and get the biggest one, cut the biggest one, not the little one, the biggest one. Lord, Lord, he got me now. So I goes out there to the tree, and I cut the smallest one, about like this wire here. Cut the smallest vine and come back. Say, that ain't what I want. I didn't see you for this little one like that. I told you the biggest one on that. So the biggest one on that, something like this. So I goes out there and 
get the biggest one. Taking my time, said, hurry up, boy, hurry up, hurry up. Now, that's going to make me beat you more longer the longer it takes you to cut that rat tie line. I'm going to beat you that much longer. So I finally got the vine cut and brought back to him. Oh, he wore me out. He split the hide on my back and I learned me not to fool his guitar anymore. So one day, a few days later, my, my mama said, oh, Sonny, she called me Sonny for sure. She said, would you go to the store for mama? I said, I sure will. So going down there to the store and I forget what she sent me at. Whatever she sent me at, I went and got it. So on my way back, here some guys came down through that little great big Fleetwood Cadillac. Two big shots. So they tossed out a box. But I didn't know it was a box, you know. I see them throw something out, so I walk it coming on back. So when I get along now, when they throw the box out. So like up in Mississippi where I was born at, it's hill, you know, have ditches, you know, and like little small mountains. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I goes down in the ditch there. I said, oh, that's a cigar box they threw it out. They smoked it like a cigar and they threw the box away. So I said, that's just what I'll need to make my own guitar so I won't catch any whoopers anymore. So I get the cigar box and brought it home, and cut me a hole in it. And then I went and got raws them off the pine trees. And I go into the chinry and get the sud out there and mix it with the melted raw and made my black paint. So I painted it black. So I said, now nah, I got that made and everything, so I'm squared away. I said, but now nah. I said, now nah, I got to put a, a keyboard on it. So I'm thinking, how was I gonna do that? And I got to thinking, I said, oh, that a picket fence out there. You know how to pick it fed all the way around the house. I go and snatch the picket off in the fence, come back, and I didn't have tools to cut it with, so I got ball glass and I sanded it down with a bottle of glass and glued it on to the cigar box. And I said, well, I, don't, I ain't got no bars on it. You know the frit bar. So I go out there and get me find the smallest haywire I could get and glue it on my picket neck. So then I said, oh, I got to have the, the, the keys on it and the tagging string. I go and uh, get another pick and whittle it down small, small to go through there. And I got a small, small wire and I go to the, had one of those rain stoves where you used to have to take and put the firewood in because we didn't have uh, running water and didn't have electric light. And so I go to the old rain stove and stick that wire in there and get it red hot and then drill a hole through the neck. So I made all my little keys and everything, so got everything together. I said, oh, thank God I got everything together. I'm ready to play now. I said, well, I ain't got no string. <clears throat> what am I going to do with string? I know I ain't got no dumb in the head to go buy a set of guitar string. So here my dad would come in at noontime for to eat his lunch. Coming out on, with, on the horse. Wide open, he come to the gate pole and tied, he always tied a horse to the gate pole. And so he went in there and eat his lunch, you know, and he got him a couple of hooks of that uh, moonshine, corn liquor he used to make. It. And he got pretty charged up there, you know. <coughs> <laughs> he stayed back there a good while, so the horse was out there, so these flies, you know, the horse flies would fly on the horse and bite him. And so he started stomping and kicking and switching his tail. And I could hear the sound of the hair on the horse's tail going through the air. I said, wow, his tail makes that sound going through the air. Look like that hair might sound on my guitar. So I go up to the horse and the horse looked back at me like that. He, he heard me talking, you know, I said, you must know what I'm talking about. I said, I want to get some of the hair out your tail to make, make, put on my guitar. He looked like, he didn't tell me it was okay, you know, but I just made it, made it okay. So I go and put a strand of hat to the horse's tail to see if it'll make a sound when it gets on. Which it should, shouldn't have made a sound. <laughs> It'd have been better off. So I got it on and put it on the guitar and it made a sound. So I kept going back and forth. See, they're very delicate. Trying to put a little pressure on it, it breaks. 
and I go back for more, for more, for more. And I pay a pull a great big ball spine horse tail. And I goes back the next time and I said, Mr. Horse, this is the last time I'm coming to worry you for some hair because I'm not gonna buy you no more. And he made sure I didn't buy them anymore. When I got there to reach the, 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 the pull a hair that time, he kicked me in the face. Oh boy, I hear bells ring, hear birds hollering, whistling. And I don't know how long I was out, but when I came back to and come back around, I said, that allowed me not to pull no more hair out of his tail. And so I looked at that great big bald spot I had pulled in the horse's tail. I said, uh oh, my daddy's gonna beat me again too. But he had a little bit too much of that snow, you know, that corn liquor. And he didn't pay that ball spot no attention. He just jumped on the horse like Roy Rogers and took out the down through, <laughs> through the woods wide open. So that's how I missed catching that wolf. <laughs> and so after that, I just waited till I got to New Orleans, a train fair to go back to New Orleans. That's because uh, I got to get there. And then I got to think what my dad said to be hold over the train. So the train track was maybe, I said maybe from here like, I will say maybe about half a block, about a block, about a block behind our house. So that evening around 3 o'clock or 3.15, the train was coming. And I run out there and I had a little flower sack that I had my pair of pants in, shoes, and a couple of shirts. So this, this, this south, the flower sack was my suitcase because I, I wasn't able to buy a suitcase. So I took and throw it on the side of the railroad track, the west side of the railroad track. So I run on the other side of the railroad so the track and lay down. And I had, this is my first time around, I had never did that before. So I jumped, lashed onto the, the boxcar. Oh boy, he was flopping and flipping me, so I didn't weigh over about 90 pounds. He was beating me all up against the car and flopping, it wasn't a kite. So finally got a chance to get a chance to get inside of the box car. <coughs> and after I got inside the box car, they had some freight on there that was in big cardboard boxes. And so they left it lying on the floor. So I said, I know they're going to get me and put me in jail if I stay close around the door if I don't get something to cover up with, hide from them. So I got underneath that cardboard. So when I got down to Osaka, that was six miles south from Macomb, they have a box factory there. And so they stopped there a few minutes. So I was so scared they were gonna come back there and pull that plywood, I mean that cardboard up and find me and put me in jail. So they did. <laughs> and so after that, then they'd come on down, come on down, and said, uh, they got to uh, the place they made one stop. And after that, they come on into New Orleans, and they got to Booker T. Washington High School, then that's why I had to bail off that. Because I got, if I'd have passed up Booker T. Washington High School, then it goes right directly <coughs> to the train station. Then they definitely would have had it. And so after I got through there and I jumped off, I bailed off like a spinning top. Tore all the bark off of my elbows, all my knees torn out and everything like that. And that was really bad. So after I got up, got, got up from that, you know, come up, pull around out through all of that. Then I started walking called Magnolia Street because my brother-in-law said, once you pass Claiborne, then you go two blocks, you'll see Magnolia Street. So I guess the Magnolia Street, go up Magnolia Street, so they had the policeman, car 17 during that time in 1957. They was a bad one, bad boy. So they both said, hey boy, where you going? What you doing out here? Walking up and down, looking at them houses like that. So you trying to break in those people's house and uh, steal what they got or either rob somebody or something like that. I said, no, no. I said, I ain't trying to rob nobody. I'm trying to find where my sister and brother-in-law live today. He said, well, where are you from? I said, Macomb, I said, so his <coughs> helper, you know, the sergeant with him, he said, no, he ain't going to, those people where well, he's from, Macomb, I said, they work for what they get. They don't rob nobody, and they don't break and burglarize nobody's house. <coughs> All right, we're going to let you go, boy. So they let me go. So what it was, they didn't tell me the address. 
and I didn't know where the address was on the house. And what had me really puzzled, all the houses were double-sided. And all of them were painted battleship gray. Every house was battleship gray and double-sided. And so I walked back and forth, so they came down there and they, come on here and get in this car, boy, we're gonna put you in jail. So finally, when they told me that, then my sister showed up. She was working at Tulane University. He said, hey, miss, what's your name? She said, yes, and how? He said, what I done did? She said, hey, you ain't did nothing. I said, uh, I said, what's your husband's name? He, she said, Harry How. And then when she walked to the car, she happened to see me sitting in the back. She said, oh my God, what is my brother doing? I said, I know he don't do anything to go to jail. What y'all bring to jail for? I said, well, we ain't gonna bring him since you done showed up. I said, you showed up. I said, it's much better. I said, we're gonna let him go. And I said, and so he said, I said, I said, see up there, boy? I said, look up over the door. You see that number numbers up there? 2314 Magnolia Street. I never will forget it now, but nobody, I didn't have a number at the first beginning. So I got down here and got the little job, you know, and got the plane around, you know, this place, that place, you know, records of uh, 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 meat market on uh, Claiborne and uh, Washington Avenue. <clears throat> so Mr. Johnson gave me a job at the gas station. So I got to work there, so I started to, went to a ceiling robot and got the acoustic guitar. Started banging on it. That's how I started, you know, started playing. And I would go out on Bourbon Street, see if I could watch the other musicians out there play, you know, so I could maybe learn how to use some, some of their cards, you know, to give myself a point to how to play. Then the police come again, say, hey boy, what you doing out here? You should be at home doing your homework. I said, no, I got a job. He said, well, it's too late for you to be out here. Where your ID at? I said, I don't have it. Where your social security card? I said, I don't have one. I said, I put in for it, but I haven't got it yet. Where you work at? So I showed him my check stuff. So all right, but you go home. I said, now, if you're out here and you come back around, we're going to put you in jail. So I couldn't learn anything that way. So I come back home, so I went back to Silver Roebuck and bought me a little 45 record player. Bought me a couple of records and put on that. And then 1971, that was when I cut my first LP. At Ruth's uh, Rock and Roll, Jazz and Blues record store on Bagman and Perez Street. And then I played after that for like uh, all across the lake, Slidell, and uh, the Branch Inn, the Village Inn, the White Kitchen, Sergeant Center, and then I used to go across the bayou, what they call bayou living, and play at the colleges and the schools over on that side. Then I used to play at the, uh, uh, the old blues box in Baton Rouge. And then I used to go to uh, to uh, Vidalia, across the river from Natchez, and used to play all that sometimes. And then I always was out of uh, Jackson and Willow by Irene. I played that for 12 years. And then I went out to Sewsbury. It was, it was on the causeway, and the causeway was something like a strip of that. It was, I used to play at the Young Men's Club, and used to play at the Horseshoe, and used to play at the Club Melody at Big Apple Place on Suicide Road. So I did that for years and years. And that's how I become to learn how to play, you know, really play the blues. 